So um, it's uh, it's nice to be talking about this topic again. Um, it's a uh, kind of my heart practice, and um, I really feel really lucky to get to have this conversation. So um, welcome everybody. We'll start just with refuge in Bodhicitta to get ourselves um, connected. So um, connecting in your heart. Sange chudon sogi chunam dae jancho padu dani capsuchi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam gi krola penche sange drupa show sange chudon sogi chunam na jancho padu dani capsuchi Dagi chanyan gi pe sonam ki Drola penchi sangge drupa sho Sangge churum so ki chunam ha Janchu padu dane gapsu chi Dagi chanyan gi pe sonam ki Drola penchi sangge drupa sho Connecting with refuge, connecting with bodhicitta. Okay, so I thought that we would start out today with kind of a brief review um, of what we talked about on the Wednesday. And when we go through this review, if you want to make a little note of any of the parts that uh, were either intriguing or confusing to you, we I really have something I want to share and unpack, or I have something that's a little bit fuzzy and I'd like to just sharpen up the edges a little bit. So as I go through those notes, just kind of um, have that in the back of your mind. And um, <clears throat> when I finish the little PowerPoint that I've made for you guys, um, we can have questions right away and then we'll go into a meditation. Does that sound good? Kind of get us all warmed up. Oh, great. <laughs> great, okay. So here we go. So I think all of you are on board with the premise, which is mind training, thought transformation, lojong in Tibetan, these are all synonyms. And it's a technique for radical reframing and transformation of suffering. And though the historical Buddha Shakyamuni referred to techniques of this type during his lifetime, they became prominent and popularized through the Nalanda tradition of India, and especially emphasized by the Tibetan Buddhist traditions through Lama Atisha, Geshe Chekawa, Geshe Langri Tampa, and other great masters to this very day. And I think that um, if you've been to Tibetan Buddhist centers for any length of time, something of this genre will have come up. You know, it's a very popular um, topic of discussion within Tibetan Buddhism, but sometimes um, the context isn't fleshed out as much and it can just sound like uh, something to aspire to that's way too hard or something that's impractical and not touching base with reality or just, you know, you can get all sorts of funny ideas around it um, unless we talk a little bit about what's the, um, the underlying premise. Here's the verse that we looked at on Wednesday, which is even if the environment and beings are filled with the fruits of negativity and unwished for sufferings pour down like rain, I seek your blessings to take these miserable conditions as a path by seeing them as causes to exhaust the results of my negative karma. So this verse kind of sums up the general walking around practice of Lojong, the everyday life kind of way of viewing Lojong as well as when there is crisis. So you can be looking at the fruits of negativity. This is the results of negative karma, right? So the results of negative karma are appearing to us all throughout our lifetime and unwished for sufferings, discomfort, annoyance, as well as really dramatic crisis are pouring down like rain. You know, there's just constant stuff going on. And what you're wanting to is to see all of it as conditions for the path, and also seeing them as ways to exhaust or finish your negative karma. So these last two lines were what we really emphasized last time, because the idea is that you're choosing to see miserable conditions as a path, rather than feeling like you're having lessons bestowed upon you, and that the burden is too much for you to bear. 
that some higher power is asking too much of you. Um, sometimes that approach can be very useful and some people really enjoy that approach, feeling like everything is a lesson given to them. But the approach in Lojong is to decide to make things a lesson proactively from an empowered stance and also to titrate the amount of lesson <laughs> that you're able to bear on a day-to-day -day basis because sometimes your capacity is more than other days. So from the seven point mind training, this falls under point number three, transforming adverse circumstances into the path of enlightenment. And I just put a couple of the bullet points. There's a whole bunch under that section. But basically, when the world is filled with negativities, transform adverse circumstances into the path to enlightenment, and then banish the one to blame for everything. So you just sit with what is the one to blame for everything? Because it's not me, and it's not God, and it's not others, and it's not the Buddha, and it's not this and it's not that, or maybe it's all of those things. But if you just sit with what is the one to blame for everything wrong in this world, everything that is suffering and uncomfortable. And from a Buddhist perspective, it's self-cherishing and self-grasping. So these are not us. They live here, but they're not us. And that's the very important point. But you'll sometimes see this point framed as drive all blames into one or banish the one to blame for everything. And I think that if you keep coming back to that point throughout your daily life, it frees up the tendency we might have to blame other people or to blame ourselves. We just think, here is one more manifestation of the self-cherishing thought. Here is one more reason why I must overcome it. And so the actual practice um, is done in conjunction with the visualization of giving and taking. And it was first kind of explained by Nagarjuna who said, may all their negative fruits ripen upon me and may all my positive fruits ripen upon them. So Nagarjuna, it's not totally certain when he lived but it was quite a long time ago within that kind of 100 year time frame. And um, he was an Indian Mahayana Buddhist Nalanda master who is widely considered one of the most important Buddhist philosophers. His text, Precious Garland, contains one of the earliest descriptions of Tonglen um, explicitly. And he's also credited with founding the Middle Way Tenet School, the Prasangika School view to be specific. So Nagarjuna was both a practitioner and a scholar. And that's really significant, I think, when we're looking at practice to see the way these two sides of exploring Buddhism go together and that they can reinforce one another. Lo Zhang emphasizes Tonglen. It's not all Tonglen, but it's basically all boiling down to Tonglen, which is this giving and taking practice. And Tonglen develops bodhicitta. Okay, so you, those are your three key words in this whole topic. Lo Zhang, Tonglen, and Janchub Kisem, or bodhicitta. And bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, sometimes translated as the spirit or heart of enlightenment, is the altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. And we understand this as different to nirvana liberation. This is like liberation plus, okay? This is enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings, which means you need omniscience. You need to be able to completely clear all the karmic imprints, the obscurations to knowledge, so that you're able to see the minds of sentient beings to assist them in the most direct and specific skillful way. So bodhicitta is the motivation that we started with and then probably even five minutes into the course, we might have forgotten that the whole point of doing this study, the point of doing these practices is in order to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. And we have to keep kind of touching back into that motivation or refreshing that motivation again and again throughout a day and throughout a life. And in repeating it in that way, it sticks and it stays for longer. 
until it stays kind of quote permanently for lack of a better word. So it's through repetition that this motivation becomes kind of how we are or who, how we live. And bodhicitta is described in the Lojong tradition in terms of conventional and ultimate and you know, you'll also hear the two bodhicittas described as aspiring and engaging. So that can get a little bit confusing. But um, in this context, we're mostly talking about conventional and ultimate. So this is related to the two aspects of reality and how to practice in response to each. Lojong practice describes both, but which comes first will vary by author. So, for example, in the seven point mind training of Geshe Chekawa, often ultimate bodhicitta is recommended as practice first and then relative bodhicitta. Whereas in Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life, it's pretty much all relative bodhicitta until like the ninth chapter. So it'll depend on the author what they start with, but both are included in all Lojong texts. So conventional. <clears throat> is this main Mahayana motivation. Yeah, if you're a Mahayanist, this is your main motivation. And the altruistic mind that seeks enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings, fully qualified, it is an uncontrived, spontaneous, main mind or primary consciousness. It is achieved upon the realizing the Mahayana path of accumulation so this means it also requires the realization of the determined nation to be free, definite emergence, renunciation. Those are all synonyms. So in order to have bodhicitta, you need a bit of renunciation. In fact, you need uncontrived renunciation, which is kind of like a letdown because renunciation seems hard, whereas bodhicitta seems so warm and friendly that actually you need them both in order to start on the Mahayana path. So the goal of enlightenment involves the need for omniscience for all cognitive obscurations to be removed in order to know how to best benefit others and aid their enlightenment. So in conventional bodhicitta, there are two types aspiring, the mind that aspires to attain enlightenment and engaging bodhicitta, the mind that actually engages in the bodhisattva activities such as the six perfections. So are you with me so far, you know, the conventional Bodhicitta, you kind of have your head wrapped around what that little sucker is. So far, so good. We'll just do a couple more slides and then we'll kind of open up the whole thing. So then we have ultimate and ultimate or absolute bodhicitta, depending on your translator. This is related to the perfection of wisdom known in Sanskrit as prajna paramita or prajna and is a direct um, unmediated realization of emptiness. Um, and so this is not the direct realization of emptiness alone. Rather, it's the direct realization in union with bodhicitta, the aspiration to become a Buddha in order to free all beings. So this union of wisdom and method constitutes the first bhumi or first level of bodhisattva attainment. Um, on the path of meditation for those of you that are acquainted with the five paths. So in other words, ultimate bodhicitta is bodhicitta in the mind of a bodhisattva who has realized emptiness directly or perceptually. So that's what we're talking about. It's not an abstract concept of emptiness. It's someone who has realized emptiness and has already realized bodhicitta both. So that's what we're talking about with ultimate bodhicitta. So there's those two. And in conventional bodhicitta, equalizing and exchanging self for others are emphasized. So that bodhisattvas cherish others to such an extent that they can give away their body, not to mention their possessions, is an amazing quality to be honored. In terms of the method aspect of the path, there is nothing more magnificent than bodhicitta. And that's from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama and Venerable um, Tubden Chudron in their book, um, The Praise of Great Compassion, <clears throat> which just came out. So I really recommend that book if you guys don't have it. So then ultimate bodhicitta, a bodhisattva with the correct view avoids the two extremes of absolutism and nihilism and is able to live according to the law of karma and its effects while at the same time 
understand that all phenomena are empty of true existence. In terms of the wisdom aspect of the path, there is nothing more marvelous than ultimate bodhicitta. Okay, so that's what we're getting up to with our Lojong practice. So here are the key components in all Lojong teachings, whichever text you come across, whether implicitly or explicitly, here are the things you're getting up to. Okay, so if you just got your head around these kind of five steps, you could walk yourself through a very powerful meditation all by yourself. Also, when you're looking at any kind of mind training text, know that this is embedded within the content. So it's actually very straightforward intellectually. It's just practice wise, it's very difficult. So we start with equalizing and this is very straightforward in terms of logic. You look at one's percentage of emphasis of self over others, as opposed to how many more others there are than self. Yeah, and you ask yourself, what does it do if I spend 90% of my day worried about me and all of the miscellaneous things I want this me to have and do, and you know, getting comfort and avoiding discomfort, et cetera, et cetera. When you spend the most part of the day thinking about yourself, are you your happiest? You know, just kind of sit with that as opposed to a day where maybe 10% you were thinking of yourself, but 90% you were thinking of how can I be of benefit to others? The people in my life, the people in my town, my society, et cetera, et cetera, or even better practicing the spiritual path. Days like that, you have an expansive and vast open worldview that makes you very relaxed about your own little inconveniences in a day your own little irritations and annoyances kind of dissolve because your view is so vast that your own specific difficulties shrink to their correct proportion or at least a smaller proportion. So it's a relief for you. And of course it's a relief for others for you to not be self-obsessed. But in equalizing self for others, just this first step is something really profound to sit with during a day especially if you're feeling really aggravated and annoyed and kind of hard done by in a day to ask yourself, if I opened it up a little bit and thought of all sentient beings, would this problem seem so big? Yeah. And of course you have to have enough background self-awareness and context for this to work. Otherwise thinking of everyone else's suffering or everyone else's welfare can make you feel even more depressed. Like, and I'm a terrible person because I don't think of others, you know, it can get into a whole spiral. But if you know the right way to think about this, then it can click in when you're having a bad day and help release your mind from this tragedy it's created for itself. The other point under equalizing is realizing that the motivation of self and others is equal or the same. We all want happiness and don't want suffering. And the causes for happiness and suffering are confused in all of us uh, to a greater and lesser degree, you know, various percentages, but all of us just wanna be happy. We just wanna have some contentment, some peace of mind, some stability, some safety. That's what's driving our choices. And we want to avoid, you know, discomfort, disconnection, disillusionment. We want to avoid those things. And that's driving a lot of our choices in the day as well. And whether they're accurate, whether they're fair, whatever, under all of our choices is this motivation. And if you sit with that, it helps you feel affinity for all sentient beings. You realize that maybe some people are more, quote, sophisticated in their drives than others, but actually at the root, it's pretty much identical. You and the ants, just wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. And it's a little embarrassing to frame your choices of your life in that way, but that humbling can also be heart opening. Okay, so just kind of sitting with equal eyes, <laughs> okay. And then we go on to the hardcore stuff, which is to identify the disadvantages of self-cherishing. 
to identify the disadvantages of self-cherishing. And remember, self-cherishing is the mind that is self-focused in a way that is indifferent to the needs of others or um, ignores the needs of others or looks after your own welfare even at the expense of others. So it's the type of self-absorption that has really kind of made you very blinkered and short-sighted. And you know, when you're in that space, most of your thoughts are, I need this, or this is too much, or this is not enough, you know, whether they're in words or they're just in an atmosphere of your mood. Self-cherishing is that. Yeah, it's self-interest, selfishness, self-consciousness, that. It's not good self-cherishing, which is, you know, taking responsibility for yourself to be well-fed, to be warm enough, to be basic needs met. So when we're talking self-cherishing in Buddhism, we're always talking about the negative self-cherishing unless explicitly said otherwise. So the disadvantages to yourself, you look at right now, what's going on for me that I don't like? You know, whether it's a relationship drama or a financial crisis or health issue, is there a way to see the link between your present moment suffering and it being worse because of self-cherishing or born from self-cherishing. And you just kind of sit with that. Yeah. When I'm self-absorbed, how does it hurt me? Of course, it's not good for others. We're going to go to that in a second. But what does it do to my mind to be in this like echo chamber of my own thoughts all day? Just kind of, you know, bouncing around dancing with my delusions, you know, <laughs> scrolling for happiness, chasing entertainment, you know, what does it do to us? And how does it affect the way we feel about people in our life? Because when we're in a self-cherishing bubble, when we're really driven by self-cherishing, we're very easily offended, or our feelings are very easily hurt. We get really fragile when self-cherishing is driving. Um, <clears throat> you know, you can sort of see it with, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see it with like fragile teenagers very easily. And we were all a fragile teenager at some point where, you know, if someone said your hair looks stupid, it like destroyed our whole day. And also that someone would say your hair looks stupid is also a self-cherishing way to speak. So both, you know, giving and receiving, that was all very clear in adolescence, what self-cherishing looks like. But remember that kind of brittle self-confident, self-consciousness, that self-consciousness that was like hyper aware of yourself, but without self-awareness, that very important distinction between being self-conscious and being self-aware. Yeah, because being self-conscious, you're always wondering, what do people think of me? Are people respecting me enough? Are people liking me enough? Am I being understood? Am I being welcomed? You know, am I being seen as, I don't know, professional or beautiful or whatever, funny or whatever? You know, you're just kind of hyper aware. What are people thinking of me? Or when you're by yourself, you're in that kind of um, hungry mind that's just kind of like, munching <laughs> yeah whether literally snacking all day or snacking with your eyes you know reading something and then watching something and then going for this and going for that and your different senses are just chasing different stimuli all day yeah this is what happens to us when we're in a self-cherishing cloud so you can think of present moment stuff as well as historically in your life when you've been in a mood that you've sunken into and invested in and you're believing this terrible mood, this is a self-cherishing cloud. And the worst form is, you know, things that we would call mental illness. And mental illness, of course, is worth huge amounts of compassion. And all of us are subject to mental illness <laughs> to various degrees. But, you know, something like very severe depression is when self-cherishing has kind of made a neural pathway in our mind and gotten so stuck in that it's our default way of thinking. And it's a terrible suffering. And if someone is suffering from severe depression, we're not going to say to them, you have self-cherishing. That's not skillful or effective or kind. 
But if we ourselves are suffering from some kind of depressive mood, um, you know, whether it's something that's been diagnosed or not, it's just something that's really heavy in us, it's worth exploring has our self-cherishing habit gotten so hardcore that now it's just our default to think this is not enough, this is not enough, I am not enough, I am not enough, the world is not enough, the world is not enough. And you're just kind of in this discontent that you've really invested in. And the difficulty when you have very much invested in this worldview is that there are of course elements of truth in that worldview, but you're taking them in isolation from the whole story. So you might look at the news and say, look at everything wrong with the news. Look at everything wrong in the world. That's why I'm depressed. Or you might look at your physical health, which might not be perfect, or your relationships, which might not be perfect, or your ambitions that have been unfulfilled or whatever it is and say, this is why I am depressed. And those things exist, but you don't see the way in which you've given the power to steal your happiness when they're unfulfilled. So looking at self-cherishing means a deep examination of your own tendencies towards attachment, but it must be done with a gentle gaze, a very gentle gaze that knows that you've suffered from this. You know, self-cherishing sounds like such an icky monster that you don't really want to say that you have it, you know, because then you're bad. And that's not the way Buddhism frames things, is it? But if you can sit with, this has really made me struggle. This has been the one to blame for everything. Yeah, this has been the thing that's stolen my peace of mind. I need to stop giving this thing power. <clears throat> So when you're identifying the disadvantage of self-cherishing, you do it for yourself first, how it's hurt you having it. Then you can do, how does it feel when other people have self-cherishing directed at you? Yeah, so when someone is really selfish, say you've got a very, I don't know, egocentric boss and they're always taking out their insecurities on their staff. You can think about rather than this boss is bad, think, look at what self-cherishing does to this person. Look at what self-cherishing does to the atmosphere of the workplace. Look at the ripple effect of this. Look at how much my peace of mind has been affected by this person's self-cherishing. So it's, it's important to make this distinction because then instead of thinking I had a horrible boss, you think my boss had horrible self-cherishing suffering. This is another way for me to understand the disadvantages of self-cherishing. I know what it feels like for this to land on me and it's horrible. So you make it personal and then you think about others and the damage you've done to others when you've been motivated by self-cherishing, just being dis you know, distracted or careless or maybe even weaponizing your words in some way and getting sarcastic and needing to win and dominate. You think of how you've hurt others because of your self-cherishing. And then you can look even broader at how self-cherishing has been the thing that has hurt the whole world. That all of the horrible decisions that political leaders make, that the decisions that people vote for, these are motivated by me first thinking. And in me first thinking, then everyone loses out. And that me first person loses out as well even if they got temporarily their needs met, in the long term, it came around and bit them. Yeah. So identifying the disadvantages of self-cherishing, <clears throat> it has to be very experiential, um, as well as very logical, and not at all beating yourself up or tearing other people down. Does that make sense, right? You know, in order to do identification of self-cherishing, you need to be able to separate afflictions from people. And then you can say, this is a terrible thing that must be destroyed without that becoming a weapon of self-harm. Yeah, if you're thinking this is me and a bad thing I have to cut out of me because I'm a terrible person, then it just becomes like neurotic and also impractical and also not true. <laughs> So you must think self-cherishing is the natural result of self-grasping ignorance, which we've all had from beginningless time. 
all of us have had it. No one's any worse than anyone else in terms of having had it from beginningless lives, right? And because of self-grasping, we have a wrong idea about how this self exists. So it's perfectly reasonable that we'd want to protect it and gather and hoard. So self-grasping is in a way very natural. It's just not necessary and in fact, very harmful. So we very much need to see self-cherishing the way we would see a disease rather than seeing it as like a character flaw. Okay, so disadvantages of self-cherishing, that's a bit heavy. Then you swap and you do the good stuff and you look at how the advantages of cherishing others. And this kind of uplifts you. So the order of these steps is intentional. So do the bad news first, then do the good news. So you kind of end on a high note. So the advantages of, self, of cherishing others, you really think about those days in which you have not been self-obsessed and not been self-absorbed when you've just had a really open heart. Yeah, your open heart days, try to remember how beautiful it feels for you personally. And that might trigger stuff for us to think about, it's in my own self-interest to think of others, to have wise selfishness. That can be a bit cringy for us because we think we're not allowed to do that or we shouldn't do that. But if you can actually realize the way in which cherishing others is worth your while, it can kind of free up some space to get a bit more altruistic about it. The, the danger is pretending that when you do good things, you do it purely with no hidden agenda. Because that's not true. Unless you're an actual bodhisattva and a very advanced bodhisattva, all of the good things you do are tainted by self-interest. So just clean it up and own it and have a sense of humor about it. But to pretend that it's not there makes you into a bit of a plastic fanatic, you know, or it can make you defensive. Um, lots of things can happen if you're not self-aware about your own good motivations and your own good activities. So to say, I have, you know, rescue cats because I am an altruistic animal rescuer and there is nothing in it for me, you know, and then the cat jumps on your lap and purrs and you pet their head and you feel so happy and soothed, you know, it's like, it's in, it's a good for both of you. You don't have to think that it's a bad thing. You like having the cat, the cat likes having a home, all is well. But you know, those, that kind of headspace you can get into where you pretend that it's all perfectly altruistic. That can get really icky and inauthentic. Yeah, so just own that it's in your own best interest to cherish others. And then you expand and try to have a bigger and bigger view of how you're all interconnected anyway. When you're working for the welfare of others, of course, the immediate thing is you're probably a more likable person. <laughs> and a more likable person is probably going to have more friends. And that's all a little bit, I don't know, mercenary. I don't know. But there is something in that of if you're feeling like people don't like you, that you're misunderstood, that you're feeling alienated, are you nice? <laughs> You know, it's sometimes as simple as that. Are we being nice to folks? Are we considering their needs before our own? If we're not, that's why they don't like us, <laughs> right? It's kind of as simple as that. And, you know, of course, there's karmic things and there's, you know, societal things and there's all sorts of other conditions. But to really sit with first things first, am I being a self-centered jerk when I'm hanging out with people? If so, let's work on that. It'll be good for me and good for them. And then you expand it to when other people have gotten over themselves, when other people are not motivated by self-cherishing, how beautiful it is to be with them. Someone who's genuinely thinking of you first, uh, how lovely it is. You know, it, some of our teachers, you really feel this, you know, if you're next to someone like Yangtze Rinpoche or His Holiness, you know that they're thinking of you before themselves. And there's just kind of a safety and a groundedness and a warmth. And, you know, it sometimes goes beyond words. But the benefit when there is no self-cherishing present or when there is cherishing of others more dominantly present, 
allow yourself to remember times like that from even really ordinary people. It doesn't have to be, you know, high llamas. It could just be from your grandmother or whoever. But remember what it was like to be in the presence of someone with cherishing others to motivate you to establish that as your go-to default way of being. And then for others, how much does it benefit your family, your community, your world, when decisions are made from the place of the broadest possible cherishing of others? You know, and you can think of just policies historically that you learned about in school or through the news that you saw the way in which having an altruistic motivation had this beautiful ripple effect and had a huge benefit to the society the people were in. And maybe it was hard to establish, but once it was established, it was such a significant thing. And, you know, everybody's country probably has some policy from, you know, 50 or 100 years ago that at the time there was a lot of resistance to, but now we just take it for granted. You know, I think about in America, the national parks, you know, the idea that there's all of this public land in all of the United States that you can just go and be in this beautiful public land. Um, of course, the premise of owning land is problematic. Of course, that land also was occupied by the traditional owners of the land, and that is also worth owning and acknowledging. But just to think about some sort of policy where everybody came together and said, let's share this. That's a nice thing. And that worked out well. Maybe you have family traditions like that, where everybody does something for each other, I don't know, around holidays or something, and then everyone is warm and uplifted because of it. So you just allow yourself to touch the real advantage of cherishing others, to touch it really experientially. And then you decide to actually exchange self for others. So you just be with that sense of choosing this practice for the benefit of yourself, others, and progress on the path, and let your choice resonate and sink in. So this stage is important because we don't want to feel like we're force feeding ourselves content just because we know it's a good idea. You know, so you might like the idea of cherishing others, but right now in this moment, you're like grumpy, <laughs> you know? And so if you're feeling grumpy, you don't want to like force yourself through your grumpy to this place that you don't actually feel. What you want to do is be with your grumpy for a minute and be like, okay, grumpy, this is suffering. This is from self-grasping and self-cherishing and it's suffering, pat, pat, you know, <laughs> pet the cat, have a snack, what, whatever you need to do in a kind of worldly, maybe afflicted way, but to kind of like get yourself enough space that then even if you're grumpy, you have enough of a window of self-awareness to kind of move through and past it or to dissolve it organically. Because if you force yourself to an ideal you're not re you're not ready for there'll be a ricochet yeah if you force yourself beyond your capacity you might sort of touch it for a minute and think yes the purpose of my life is to benefit all sentient beings and self-cherishing has been the root of all evil and down with self-cherishing and you stretch and then it was too much and you snap back you know like if you had never stretched in your life and then you went to a ballet class you know, like you might be able to force your legs into certain positions, but then when you got home, you'd stiffen right up, you know? And even if you took a nice hot bath with lots of, I don't know, Epsom salts, still the next day, you're gonna be like, that was too much for me. And you might actually stretch less than you did before you did the class. So if we, we wanna push ourselves just to that like discomfort, but not pain, just like you would with exercise, just like a tiny bit of, oh, this is stretching me a little bit. This is a little bit more than what I normally do, but it's not so dramatically more that it triggers an inner rebellion and then you backslide. So navigating your life with your own self-cherishing, it, you know, it really is like a conversation between two sides of yourself, you know, a rational and an irrational or a kind and a self-centered. And navigating the conversation between these two aspects of yourself, it's delicate and it really needs a lot of spaciousness and real-time self-awareness that doesn't think that you're able to do your best work every single day. Your best work is your best work because it's occasional. What's your 
everyday work, <laughs> you know, and kind of plan based on how you are on an average day as opposed to how you are at your best, then you won't get disappointed in yourself either. So spiritual maturity means you know where you're going and you know where you are. And you don't think that because you know where you're going, that's where you already are and should be and bad if not already. You hold the aspiration as like a joyful thing you're moving towards as opposed to a pressure you're imposing. And what we normally do is we, we aspire to these amazing ideals and then we put this pressure on ourselves like because I understand it intellectually, I should already be able to do it. Why can't I do it consistently? I'm bad. And then we give up, <laughs> you know, and we think the Dharma doesn't work, Pleh. or I'm a special case that will never be changed, Pleh. you know, and we toss it all out. So inspiration and aspiration need to be something that uplift as opposed to something that suppress or dominate or are imposed. You know, it shouldn't feel like a bag of rocks you're carrying around. Your practice shouldn't feel like a chore. Do you know what I mean? So to really have spiritual maturity means that you see the huge gap between where you actually are and where you're going. And then is really happy with yourself with even the most micro changes. You know, even if like this last holiday season with everybody's conflicted ideas about what's going on politically and what's going on with the pandemic and everybody's, you know, myriad opinions, if you were able to have one conversation with someone you disagreed with or you didn't lose it, but normally you would, like celebrate, you know, like bring out the rock band, like this is huge, you know? Rather than thinking of all the times that you slipped and went back into your own ha old habits of needing to prove or explain or change or whatever, you know, so, so rather than punishing yourself for being how you've been habitually for who knows how many lifetimes, celebrate when you're able to make even tiny incremental change. You know, if you had a tiny baby learning to walk, you're not punishing it every time it falls down, you're cheering every time it stands up. And this is really the mentality we need to have. Like, why are you being mad at yourself for not being able to consistently do something new? It's new. So of course you can't do it consistently. You know, so just this really, okay. Disadvantages of self-cherishing, advantages of cherishing others. Yep. And I definitely want to exchange them. I definitely want to exchange cherishing self for cherishing others. I definitely want bodhicitta. That is what I want. Therefore, I'm going to practice Tonglen very gently with a stretch that doesn't go into pain and an awareness of the present of today, how much can I push it and not assume that you can stretch to your best day. And if you're able to just even take on the suffering of yourself in 20 minutes from now, <laughs> that's still releasing resistance and expanding your ability and getting more mental flexibility. So it's, it's this kind of decision-making process that you make intentionally with yourself. Okay, so once you decide and you let it resonate and it's something that is a true thought rather than an imposed thought that you're trying to kind of I don't know, force into yourself when it's actually something that is flowing organically. Yes, this is the way I want to live. Then you actually do your tongue land. Yeah. And it's, you know, here's just the simple form, which I think you guys know. Give on the out breath, visualize golden light. Take on the in breath, visualize black smoke. Give loving kindness off of your past, present, and future happiness. Take using compassion, take the past, present, and future suffering. So give and take and give and take, riding on the breath and gradually expanding the radius. So as with, as um, Geshe Chakawa would say, start with yourself. So you start with just what is the suffering of myself? Voluntarily take it back. What is the happiness I'm clinging to? Release attachment by letting it flow forward. Okay, so 
when you're doing this practice of giving and taking, I think that you have to remember the, the psychology under it so that you feel motivated. So the psychology is how much easier things are when they're voluntary. Yeah. So for example, if you were forced into a labor camp and you had to lift heavy rocks and put them in a truck, you would be grumpy and resentful, understandably. If you were a bodybuilder working for the, out for the Iron Man and you had to you know, go lift the same amount of weight and put it in the same kind of direction for the same amount of hours, but you were working towards this goal of being the Iron Man or whatever, it's not a suffering because it's voluntary. So our mind says it's the activity that's making me suffer when of course it's your mind's attitude towards the activity that's making you suffer. And then your little logic says, yes, but yes, but things in my life that are hard aren't voluntary. I can't just tell myself that they're voluntary, you know? And so how do you make yourself like the idea of hardship? You go back to the beginning and remember any hardship born well finishes old negative karma. It finishes it. So it's like purification without any extra practice, except there is a little extra practice because you can't react with an affliction. So, you know, your spouse is, I don't know, ranting about something that they always rant about. And this time, this one time you respond with patience instead of clapping back that finishes a little bit of that harsh speech karma that you are wearing through hearing them. And so, you know, remembering that you can think more easily on making the hardships of my life voluntary. You can think even more broadly, like, you know, climate change, like, like famine and pandemics and et cetera, et cetera. You don't want these things to happen. Of course we don't. But if you decide that every single one of these things is making me stronger, because it is, if you view it in the right way, then it starts to feel voluntary. And then your resistance is less, and then your suffering is less, right? Because you have your suffering, but then you have all your resistance to your suffering, which compounds the suffering. So if you can dissolve that layer, already there's relief. Does that make sense? So, so that's the kind of like basic structure of all mind training texts, so those five steps. Um, how are you guys going with it? Is, is it all making sense? Are there ideas you want to share or um, questions? Yes, Scott? I have just a little question to roll back to the cherishing others, mm -hmm. which uh, you know, I, I, I followed along very well with that, except that there, where is the end to that though? There has to be sort of a boundary to that. And I don't, and I'm unclear about how to sense when you're there. Well, wh uh, what's, what's the fear of thinking that you need to have an end to the boundary? Are you worried that you're going to be taken advantage of or that you'll run out of steam? That it will, har that it will harm me. That, I, that it can become a non-self-cherishing piece at some point. That you could um, kind of overstretch your capability and then turn into a martyr? Overstretch my ability and become um, um, not a martyr exactly, more like um, harm, fit, harmed, emotionally harmed, emotionally hurt. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's an important thing to unpack because, you know, there's the aspiration and then there's the where you're actually at and working up to it. And, you know, it sounds cliche, but, you know, boundaries, not barriers, right? Healthy boundaries are very important and don't go against cherishing others. But once, sometimes when you overstretch, what happens is then, yeah, overwhelmed is a good, is a good word. You can get overwhelmed. What can happen is that if you stretch your capacity too much, then when you establish boundaries, 
you know, too late, they actually become barriers, you know? So it might be that at the beginning of, I don't know, something you said, I am free all day on Fridays. And then you realize you're not really free all day on Fridays. You're free for seven hours on a Friday, but that's actually the, uh, the amount of energy you have. And, but you push yourself because you already committed, you know, you already committed. And then once you get really, really tired, you get grumpy and you say, okay, I'm setting a boundary and it's only seven hours and you better not call me out of those seven hours, Grr, you know, and it becomes this like hard edged thing. Whereas if in the beginning you knew your capacity, you could say seven hours on a Friday, but it's flexible. Sometimes it'll be more, sometimes it'll be less, but my boundary is, you know, generally speaking the seven hours and it's got nice soft edges to it, but it's clear in your mind and you're not defensive when you need to adjust it. And if someone says, you said uh, on Fridays you're free, Can are you free this Friday? And you say, generally I am free on Fridays, but today I'm feeling a little unwell. Can we reschedule it a week from now? You know, you have kind of a gentleness, but if you've pushed past your, your capacity, then you start making these hard edges around your boundaries and it gets really tight and brittle and you can get really grumpy with people when in fact you're grumpy at yourself. So that's one thing that can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and that that can be hard on our pride because we want to think we have the capacity we committed to. And then when we find out that we don't have the capacity we committed to, we're disappointed in ourselves and we're maybe mad at other people for accepting that and et cetera, et cetera. It's a whole thing. Yeah, but when it's cherishing others in its pure sense, it's just an attitude, okay? The choices you make from that attitude adjust day to day. They adjust according to your ability and your personality. What you're trying to work on is just this mental attitude that says, it is in everyone's best interest, including my own, if I have an open heart that has a big picture mentality. It's good for me, it's good for them. Sometimes I'm gonna forget and I'm gonna you know, shrink my world down to this one tiny person. And I'm gonna think this person's needs are the most important or the least important, but there's a dramatic most or least kind of self you know, that flares. That's quite natural. But if you know your default thing that you're working towards is this expansive worldview, you know, every time you think you've got the big picture, the picture keeps getting bigger, you know, and keeps getting bigger. And, you know, you start looking in terms of the world and intersectionalism, or you start looking in terms of interdependence, and you start looking in terms of science and biology, and you start looking in terms of this and this and this and this and trying to hold everything in your mind at once, and then you get overwhelmed and collapse. You know, that can happen. And so assume it'll happen and you're not bad for it happening. It just means you hadn't quite gauged the pacing yet, you know? And, and so we're trying to just de-identify from our gaps and de-identify from our, you know, quote weaknesses or lack of knowledge and ability to not think that those are us. We're just trying to have this really, like psychology would say, you know, a growth mindset that's able to see what we're not able to do as just something we haven't learned well yet. It's not a deficiency. It's just something we haven't practiced enough for it to become second nature. You know, if something comes really easily, it doesn't mean that it's a magic innate ability to us. It means it's something that we've done a lot, you know, and that we had a lot of conditions that supported us. So if you're, for example, a very generous person and you never hesitate to give and share and offer, that's not like an amazing character trait that you have ownership over. It's a good quality that was born from interdependent circumstances. You know, so just like with bad qualities, good qualities similarly. You know, you were, you're only a generous person because maybe your family uh, culture supported that or your family culture didn't support that and it made you think generosity is important, right? It could go either way. But, you know, to really realize that everything that you think of as you is just a coming together of experiences. There's not the ownership feeling that self-cherishing gives us. Because self-cherishing can build things like pride 
and destroy our ability to have confidence. You know, confidence is, I have Buddha nature, which can never be destroyed. Pride is, I'm better than everyone else. <laughs> now I have to prove it. And I'm all alone at the top and feeling quite sad, you know? So it, it's just, it's a little bit delicate, but I think that's why basic non-reactive meditation can be really useful because you start to see that there's your mind and then there's a lot of mental factors <laughs> and the mental factors have a lot to say and they have a lot of opinions and a lot of movement, but there is something different that is also expansive, spacious and clear that you can always kind of come back to and rest in. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that helps Scott, but it's just pacing. Yeah, it's pacing. Yes, it was actually quite helpful. It's it's the seeing, it's the it's setting an intention before I start out that's important yeah. to, to make the edges softer because otherwise I become um, overwhelmed as leaders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, and enough, you know, kindness towards yourself to be able to adjust as well. Cause we we think we know where we are and then we have to just try it out and see. And sometimes we overestimate, sometimes we underestimate. So whatever you can do to get yourself to have a very flexible mind that doesn't feel defensive about changing its mind. You know, when you say, yeah, I thought I could do that. It turns out I can't. Whoops. So now I'm going to do this. Sorry if that's inconvenient for anyone. Can I manage the inconvenience for anyone? But that's where I'm at, <laughs> you know, and to try and do it in an undefensive way is hard. Yeah. Or to say, I committed to this, but actually I've got a lot more space than I realized. I can do this and this and this if you'd like me to. You know, just kind of a assessing and reassessing of where you're at any given day. Yeah, just gentle. So um, those five leading up to Tonglen. What, what else came up? See, there's a question in the chat. Um, Christina says, is it bad if we overestimate in caring for others at the expense of time for yourself, care for our physicals so we can continue cherishing others? Yeah, bad is a tricky word, isn't it? Um, it? It's a little bit like, you know, this analogy gets used a lot in Dharma groups, but it is like when you're on the airplane and this flight attendant says, you know, when the pressure thing drops and the thing falls down, put it on your own mouth first and then see if you can help others. You know, it's cliche, but it's quite true of, you need to be able to be a healthy, robust, happy, vessel to be of benefit to others. What self-cherishing does is it kind of makes this a finite project, like once I'm happy and healthy, then I'll help. That's what self-cherishing says. Cherishing others says, what do I need to do to get happy and healthy enough to be in an expansive headspace? Because the point is this expansive headspace. Okay, I have not been eating enough vegetables, especially green ones. Okay, it's a broccoli kind of a day, you know, for the welfare of all others, I need to be broccoli focused, you know, <laughs> whatever. But it's, it's very different than thinking, once I get all my act together, then I'll help people. That's self-cherishing. Cherishing others says, I must look after myself, but in a very practical, a very common sense way, kind of a tick box way. Yeah, I'm gonna need this amount of time in the morning to get myself steady. I'm gonna need this amount of kind of food and break time and sleep time. And it's not a hard edged need, it's a general premise that I'm flexible to shift within. You know, it's like, generally speaking, I would like this amount of sleep. I'm going to plan my life with this amount of sleep. But if I consistently offer myself this amount of sleep, some days I can go with less, you know, and that's not going to be a, a massive sacrifice. It's just going to be a mild discomfort that I'm happy to do for the sake of others. But I also then have the flexibility to catch up when space arises in my schedule and not feel guilty about sleeping more, you know, for example. So, so it's very, it's, it's just really about changing your mindset and your worldview. You know, the purpose of my life is to be of benefit to all sentient beings, which means I need to understand what benefit is. I need to understand what happiness is. I need to understand those causes very deeply and experientially, which means a lot of the time I am my own guinea pig. 
you know, a lot of the time I am looking at just my own life, just my own mind, but I'm doing it with the idea that this is all going to be of benefit to others rather than I need to do this first and then this second. It's like, however much you're able to integrate that much, you're also able to benefit others that day. You don't have to wait to be enlightened in order to benefit others. It's just you're gently expanding your capacity and your ripple effect. Does that make sense, that distinction? Because we have a lot of that conversation in our head that says, <laughs> um, once I do this, this, and this, then I'll this, this, and this, you know, and then, you know, when is life ever that tidy? Yeah. So it, it takes that ability to separate yourself from your afflictions to say, this, this is my choice in my worldview, but I might not live up to it every day. And then you have a, a humility that feeds humor rather than a humility that feeds self-loathing. Yeah. Let's see, there's another one. Yes, not to be exhausted, grumpy martyr. Okay, so um, would you guys like a little short break before we do meditation? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 